Hello, and welcome to my presentation on how HDMI works by me, James Meredith, for CS4302. So, uh, I'm sure as many of you are aware, HDMI is a widely used standard for connecting things like media players and computers up to monitors or TVs. This presentation will go through how all that works and how HDMI is designed from a signal processing perspective. So, HDMI, or High Definition Multimedia Interface, is used primarily for transmitting uncompressed video data along with either compressed or uncompressed audio. It was defined in 2002 by a group of seven companies that call themselves the founders of HDMI. You can see their logos here on the slide. Later, however, in 2011, the companies formed a forum that HDMI manufacturers could join to later help inform the development of HDMI. Today, that forum is made up of almost 1,700 companies that all work together to develop the new specifications. And, as of January 6, 2015, 4 billion devices have been sold with HDMI capability. HDMI was quickly starting to become the go-to for device manufacturers, as it was easy to use and popular for consumers. As for today, the most recent version of HDMI is version 2.1 that was officially announced by the HDMI forum on January 4, 2017. However, we're going to mostly mainly look at the way HDMI version 2.0b works right now because by far it's the most widely used. A HDMI cable is a bunch of wires bundled together, each responsible for a different task. There are 19 such wires. Most of them are just grounded pins, but there is also a 5 volt pin, as you can see in the image at the bottom right. What we're interested in, though, is everything else. Firstly, we have a display data channel. This is for transmitter and receiver to negotiate the best parameters for transmission. What's the best resolution they support, or how many times the screen should refresh a second? Then, the Transition Minimized Differential Signaling, TMDS, channels, which account for eight signal-carrying wires. This is where we'll focus. Interleaved video, audio, and some auxiliary data are all transmitted over these wires. Additionally, we have Consumer Electronic Control. This allows devices to control each other over HDMI. This allows us to have things like universal remotes, for example. Finally, we have a few extra features like audio return for things like surround sound speakers, Ethernet, and HDCP, which is for dig protecting digital content rights. So moving on, we're going to have a closer look at TMDS. This communication standard is performed over eight pairs of twisted wires, as mentioned earlier. These wires are shielded with a grounded steel layer around them. TMDS has red, green, and a blue channel, each with a pair of wires and a pixel clock channel, all represented across the middle of this image. The clock is used to synchronize the sender and receiver, and the RGB channels are used to transmit data for each pixel. We also have a special encoding applied to the data, shown in the diagram within the data encode boxes. Next, we're going to move on to some of the techniques for preserving signal integrity used in TMDS. But first, why are we doing any of this? Why can't we just transmit the data down the wire and see it at the other side? Well, we have to worry about electromagnetic interference. This can degrade a signal and leave us with just blurry noise. We need to minimize the number of bit flips due to this interference. Furthermore, EMI can come from anywhere, such as nearby signal transmitters, power lines, or even solar flares. The picture on the slide shows the effect of a solar flare on a television signal and the blurry picture we're left with without paying proper attention to signal integrity. Our first technique is to twist together the conductors in our signal. We do this to cut down on the magnetic field generated by a wire with current flowing down it. As you can see in the image, a wire with current creates a circular magnetic field. This magnetic field can drive currents in other conductors and cause interference. Now if we take another conductor and pass an equal and opposite signal down it, we will get the opposite magnetic field. Then twist these wires together and the fields will cancel each other out. This method is widespread and a cheap, easy way to vastly improve the range of our signals. Moving on, we have differential signaling, the DS in TMDS. We have our equal and opposite signals leading to less interference being emitted, but we can also use this to cut down on the effect of EMI coming in from outside, like solar flares for example. If we subtract one signal from another and look at the difference between them, we can get a better picture of what the original signal looked like. If we look at this diagram, we have a sender sending the original signal and the inverse on the left. Then, during the transmission, the red line representing the noise is introduced. This interferes with the two signals and drives the same current in each. Therefore, as we can see on the right, the original signal and the inverse now have noise. However, the difference between these signals is still the same amount, so when we subtract them, we get the same result as what was originally transmitted. With the wire twisting and differential signaling, we see even greater ranges and signal integrity. Finally, we have signal encoding. This is where the transition minimized part of TMDS comes from. We experience the greatest interference at bit transitions in a signal. This is where we transfer from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0 in our digital signals. The sharp transitions get worn away by interference. If we can minimize the number of times that happens, we can cut down degradation even further. We use an encoding scheme that takes our 8-bit input and converts it to a 10-bit code word with our desirable properties. The coding has two stages. 
first, we take the first of our 8 bits and leave it as it is. This is our first code word bit. Then following that, we generate the next 7 in one of two ways. We zor the next bit with the one before, or we zor and invert the next bit with the one before. We choose whichever one produces the word with the fewest flips overall and encode which option we chose in bit position 9. Then, in stage 2, we do an optional inversion of the whole word so far to even out the number of 1s and zeros across the transmission as a whole. This is represented in bit position 10. We do this to minimize lots of small transitions in code words. We go from a maximum of 8-bit transitions to only 5. Despite the increase in size of words, meaning a lower real data rate, we have far fewer transitions leading to far less chances for signal degradation. All of this results in allowing us to improve the quality of video over HDMI without worrying about signal degradation. HDMI 2.0b supports a maximum bandwidth of 18 gigabits per second, 14.4 of which is for video data. It supports 4K at 60 refreshes every second, which means we send roughly 8.3 million pixels every 16 milliseconds. We can even push two video streams at once down the cable with four audio streams. Finally, one of the biggest differences you'll be able to see from past versions is the addition of high dynamic range, HDR, which allows us to see a greater range of colors from deeper blacks to brighter whites in the content. In 2017, there were even more improvements with HDMI 2.1. Firstly, we take the clock signal in TMDS and embed it in our RGB signal channels. These channels now function with packets of data with their timing built in. Then, with our new spare clock channel, we convert it to another RGB channel, leading to four total. We use a more efficient encoding scheme that takes 16 bits and converts it to 18, leading to a higher proportion of code words being actual data. Efficiency is now 88.8% .8 from just 80%. We also get an optional low latency lossless video compression. All of this allows for up to 48 gigabits per second, nearly three times what we had before, and we can now display 10K at 120 Hz. In conclusion, HDMI is a great example of several signal processing techniques all working together to increase signal integrity and improve data transfer speeds. We can improve signal integrity by using physical techniques such as shielding and wire twisting to prevent interference, or techniques such as differential encoding to react and remedy interference. And finally, we can encode the data itself so that it will be more resistant before it's even transmitted. Thank you for listening.